Chris Stanmore Major. Well, it's episode five. We're starting to get along with the project now with Hellcat. Um, I've just included this bit of video here of us uh, sailing a Challenger just so we've got something to look at uh, whilst we introduce the show. It's so difficult to create intros and, and outros uh, while you're just chatting about something as dry as rigging. But uh, I hope that you get uh, some information from this. I enjoy sharing this kind of information. We don't get it very much anywhere else on YouTube. And uh, yeah, forgive me my editing. <laughs> All right, so this is day five, I guess this is. Um, we've got a lot achieved. I had a monster cleaning session last night on the uh, the boom bag, um, all the stuff that's down. I knew I was gonna be working in this area today, so I wanted to get this really tidied up. Um, there's still a lot of mold on stuff. Like you try jet washing hundreds and hundreds of meters of rope. Like you can get a certain amount done, and then you know what? The ocean will do the rest as soon as we get out to sea. So, so we're getting to work today. So what I wanna do is that whilst the PBO, this, it's probably got life in it still. It's 10 years old now. Um, I think by any racing standards you want it off, but the reality is it's got life left in it as long as we don't push it too hard. Um, we're just going to be slowly poddling our way back across the Atlantic, keeping the boat way under what it is that uh, it can do. But the reality is that we don't want to be in a situation where um, something breaks, you know, a stitch in time and all that. Uh, so we need to make sure that the weak links in the system here are dealt with. And the weak links are the lashings. So I guess it's easiest to see here. This is the, where the staysail goes. It has a self-tensioning, well not self-tensioning, I can tension the bottom of it to increase and decrease. I can cut away little bits of this kind of stuff, but the key thing is down here. This yellow lashing, which looks like it's made out of sisal or something, is made out of Vectram, which is another aramid fiber. It's very, very strong, and it has very low creep. Creep is the, um, creep is the property whereby a line will gradually increase its length when it's put under pressure. So for rope, like uh, the rope that goes onto the boat which we use for the sheets and the halyards, Dyneema has a certain amount of creep, but it doesn't matter for a halyard or for sheets because you just retension it slightly. A spinnaker halyard or a spinnaker sheets, they're forever in motion. For items of rigging, creep becomes a problem because they're sitting under tension for long periods. So Vectran and PBO and carbon are very, very good for rigging because they have very low creep factors. So in this situation, the line at the top here is, um, this is this is PBO inside here. This is probably, this could be a Vectran rope. In fact, I think it probably is a Vectran rope sheathed up inside of this, um, this Technora. But inside here, or this part here, this is Vectran being used as a lashing to hold the block down. And over here, more clearly, this is the forestay of the boat, which is, well, it's one of the forestays of the boat, the inner forestay, I guess you could say, where the, um, the solent, the, the big jib at the front goes up and down, um, with his furling gear at the bottom. It's lashed to the boat here with Vectran. Now that Vectran's probably good for eight tons per wrap, and I think the rupture on this, the break on this uh, is 16 tons. So I need to be able to replace this lashing and know that although this PBO is probably dropped to half of its strength, I'm not putting anywhere near its braking loads on it. Up at the front here, we've got another PBO stay. It's got a Dyneema lashing at the bottom. And for this, it's probably not that big a problem. The way this boat's rigged, this that comes right onto the prow, goes all the way to the top of the rig up here, and it doesn't have a sail go up it. I find that a little bit odd, and it might be something that we change in the future. I think that this can very easily have a furling gear here, and we can have something like a Genoa, something potent that goes up on that one. Um, the bowsprit down there, more Vectran lashings. These are uh, Dyneema lines, uh, uh, the halyards. So we need to redo the lashings on those. The bowsprit underneath there. Um, there's a lot of stuff here that's got Vectran lashings on. On top of that, oh, where am I? <laughs> on top of that, the rig itself, whilst the vertical bits are rigging, this is V1 here on the port side. V1 is bolted and terminaled and everything onto the deck as you might expect. But D1, diagonal one on the port side, is lashed on. And as we go up the rig, if you look up here, there's a vertical one. It's discontinuous rigging, which means that this little part, hey, you can just sort of see me. This is interesting. This part here, the vertical, 
this is bolted at the spreader here and then oh, you've got to be very careful your hand goes doing this here in this area here it's bolted onto another piece of rigging another vertical that then goes up to the second spreader which is up here and then it's bolted to another bit of rigging that goes up 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 to the top up up there okay but the diagonals which are these bits going up in here and going up in here they are bolted at the top man this is really tricky to work out the orientation they're bolted here but then they're lashed here so very quickly we can see that for say the PBO is dropped by 50% of its strength that's fine for what we're going to do but that Vectran one of its key weaknesses is kryptonite no is sunlight sunlight is a big problem for it it gets UV damage very very quickly and even though the lashings on the inside or the turns on the lashing on the inside may be protected from the UV if the outside ones fail the lashing is immediately undone so what we're going to do is for once I've calculated it's about 20 meters of lashing I brought the uh, synthetic stainless steel from Pelican Rope. I bought that with me. That's a rope that we custom built with Pelican. The outside is something that we design, which is easy to handle. Um, but inside that is that stainless steel, um, synthetic stainless steel from Pelican, which is uh, 8,800 kilos um, breaking strain. Because we're only going to use it for crossing the Atlantic once, the creep won't become a factor in such a short period of time. We're then going to take the rig down when we get over to um, North America, and when the lashings are redone and done, done permanently after the rig has been redressed and refit, then they'll be back in Vectram. So, lashings. So, the forestay, outer forestay at the moment, is still under some tension. That's because whilst I've taken the backstays off, the backstays on the back of this boat, uh, there is no permanent backstay. We have two running backstays. The boom, obviously, if we have a quick look from here, and step off oh, onto my lovely clean swept dock, which I did the other night. <laughs> Thank God I came back here. It was what a waste of time. Look here, so here's the backstay. Oh, we'll do this pointy thing again. Here's the backstay, and it goes from the back of the boat up to the top of the rig up there. Meanwhile, here is the boom. And that's the halyard holding the boom up now but the sail comes to here and then the sail goes up 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 and the sail size would be massively limited if it had to move underneath the backstays that is um, exacerbated by the fact that we don't have just one but we have one two three backstays this is the check stay which is what goes up to the second spreader and opposes the staysail where we just were with the white line that you can increase and decrease the tension this mainstay, which is this one in the middle, which goes up to the third spreader and comes down and meets that yellow uh, Vectran lashed furling forestay, inner forestay we just looked at. And then this one, which is the topmost stay or the tip stay, goes up to the very top and comes down and meets that white lashed forestay, the outer forestay, which has no sail on it at the moment. With those three in place, to oppose all of the loads from the headsails, the mainsail would have to be smaller than this triangle here. The mainsail will be able to go directly from a boom that finished here and it will be able to go up to the second spreader, which would be useless. So what we have to do is we have to have uh, running rigging at the back. The back stays can go on and off. So at the back here we can see quite clearly we got one set over on starboard and then the other set on port. When the wind is coming from the starboard side of the boat, the starboard backstay rigging is on and that's opposing the load that's created by the wind when the winds coming from the other side of the boat the other set of rigging is on and then it opposes the new forces from the new side all very easy it's something though that you have to be very 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 focused on because if you make a mistake with this the rig is no longer supported and it will go out the front of the boat now because this has got back swept spreaders this boat will be rated for about uh, full jibe in 15 knots true okay so that is awesome because that means that suddenly you have this like ability to jive and if you kind of cock it up a little bit it's not a huge problem you wouldn't want to push that but you can do it and there is a moment in every jive when you're with these boats unless you're literally going to stop and granny tack around or you're going to reef completely there is a bit where the backstays are like only just slightly on that's your safety net but for us, what we need to look at today is the fact that these blocks, when they come down to the deck, yes, of course, oh, let's go around this way, it'd be easier to see. Yeah, it's all lashed on in there, okay? And that's exactly the same as on Challenger. Challenger has got um, 
uh, flat spreaders, uh, inline spreaders. She's not rated for a jibe with anything other than back stays on, which makes her a little bit slow through the jibes. But it's easier to do when you've got the original idea of a team of 12 professionals. Um, for us, what we did is we have that modified top mast, which has a permanent stay on, which allows us to run a very highly strung, literally highly strung boat with people who are new to it without freaking out about the, um, the, the rig falling down. But uh, looking through this, I've got the, the main sheet over there also needs a lashing. It needs a lashing at the top that goes around the boom, although that Dyneema, yeah, maybe okay, but lashing around the boom, lashing at the bottom of the uh, main sheet, um, lashings for the turning blocks for the main. I don't want to be hit by that coming down. Everything else in that system is, uh, is bolted in, basically. Um, I need to do lashings on the diagonals. I need to do lashings down here at the bottom that we looked at. I need to do lashings on the four stays. All in, it comes to 26 lashings, and I bought with me like two, 200, 200 feet of, um, of uh, synthetic stainless steel from Pelican, so I'm not worried about that at all. It's time, but the issue we've got, which I guess is why we came back to the boat, is that the boom, at the moment, I've taken the back stays off, they're now loose. You can get hold of these and give them a, a waggle, but there's still the boom on this one. The boom on Spartan weighed 70 kilos, and Spartan, the boom came to the back of the boat. In fact, it didn't pass back the back of the boat. So, on open 60s, you're allowed to have a certain amount of overhangs, about two meters, yeah, six foot on top of your 60 foot. So, what Spartan had was the boom ended pretty much where that lashing is on this boom, okay. And then on the front, it had a bowsprit that was about six foot. So there was no overhang at the back. And then there was six foot of overhang at the front. This boat, because it's optimized for going upwind, has got a boom which goes from where Spartan's finished, which was here. Oh man, I'm going to get this worked out this way, yeah? It's like trying to shave in a mirror. Okay, it goes, it has this extra meter of boom that hangs out the back of the boat. That is why this boat has got such a small stubby bowsprit because under the original rules you're only allowed to have two meters of um, two meters over overhang so if you then come to the front you can only have one meter over overhang now the thing is that this small amount of projection does help it does help the sails it means that you're not getting your sails caught all over your four stays and all the rest of it but it is another identifier where we can see this boat is highly specialized towards the thing that we wanted to do which is go upwind again it's got fixed keel and it's got dagger boards okay it's got rudders which are right at the very 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 tippy back of the boat so that the back has as much traction as possible when you're going upwind there's as much leverage there as is possible it has this main boom which overhangs the back of the boat so we get maximum boom and the boom is obviously in the main cell is what we're using going upwind so this boat, I say again, is highly optimized. Now, the boom is bigger than Spartan's. So I would say a Spartan's boom weighs 70 kilos. We're probably up on about 100 kilos for this boom. And at the moment, that 100 kilos is hanging from the top of the rig. And the top of the rig is connected to the forestay, the white Dyneema lashed forestay. So what we got to do is we got to take the halyard off, which is this guy here. This one I prepared earlier. Remember that the rig, we can release everything like this and be, still be relatively happy because between the yellow force day, the inner force day, and the, um, the cap shrouds and the diagonals between the verticals and the diagonals in this location, the rig is still easily holding itself up. You try doing this with a um, deck spreader rig, which is what Spartan had, which is sitting on basically a two and a half inch Reese um, trailer hitch ball on the bottom and then has two, you take everything off, the rig is like, whoa, like moving all over the place. And the same with, um, with Challenger and Charger, because they don't have back swept spreaders, they've got parallel spreaders. When you take the back stays off, the whole rig just bends forward and takes all the pressure off the four stays. I was kind of hoping that would happen here because my life would be a bit easier. But no, the thing here now is I've released everything at the back and the inner four stay, it's still tight because it's in a triangle rigging formation with the diagonals and with the verticals on the main part of the mast. But the tip of the mast, which is, see this forestay only goes up to the third spreader. The outer forestay, let's try and do this again. This one goes up to here. This is the inner forestay, the one with the jib on it. How do I reach up there? Is that even possible? I've got to do some trick of perspective. There we go. Oh, I see, so I go close to the camera. So this one that's up here, 
at this point up here, which is where the um, outer forestay connects, that's beyond the triangle which is described by the yellow forestay and the rigging that we saw just then. So with the main halyard off, the outer forestay is now loose, which is good news if you're the guy like me trying to replace that lashing. So I think I can do one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, say 16, 17. I got about 17 lashings I can do here now, which become available. And then I've still got six up the rig. Is that right? Six up the rig? No, one, two, three, sorry, three, six on the rig, including this guy. And then one at the front that has to be done, but cannot be done until the rig comes off jack. And the rig is gonna come off jack later on today, hopefully, when we get this. This is where those round jacks that we had with the Enna pack, the yellow jack thing, they come and sit here. That metal bar goes through here, and then we jack up the rig. We undo these Allen bolts here. We take out this, um, this brick, which is a piece of metal that's split on either side, and then we lower the mass back down, and that one inch difference in height is going to make a world of difference to the tension on the rig. And that's then going to make the diagonal and vertical rigging go loose, at which point we can replace the six lashings on the rig and the lashing on the forestay. And I do see this lot coming like, oh man, I do like making the lashings because they're actually, as we'll see, very beautiful part of the stuff that we do and they're very um, decorative and they're easy to do and they are so strong. It's what an aspect of the saying that I really, really love because um, I love the fact that modern world and uh, older world in sailing collide like head on They all the time. We had lashings in sisal and manila and then we went to shackles and then we went to alloy shackles and hardened shackles and titanium shackles and then with inventions of things like uh, Dyneema and Vectran and PBO, suddenly we're straight back to lashings and they're stronger and more flexible and lighter and more replaceable than ever before. So I love doing this aspect of it, but <laughs> there's like 30 lashings to do. Uh, so I think I'll set up a bit of a production line. What's an amazing piece of uh, detail just before we finished here that I did find is when I was going through all that paperwork, a rigger that did the rigging on this boat has drawn pencil drawings of every lashing on the rig these six that are on the main rigging and that person in their infinite wisdom has measured every lashing from the outside of the um, the terminal on the on the rigging down onto the tang on the deck or wherever it's connecting he's measured it to the millimeter or she's measured it to the millimeter which means that you know I could take the lashing off here but then this tension in the line when the rig goes back on jack is determined by the length of the lashing. So I would be re I would be altering the tension in the rig. I'd be essentially tuning or detuning or just basically screwing up the rig if my lashings weren't exactly the right length. So I gotta measure them all anyway, which I'll do and I'll compare it to those numbers. But I have this resource which says, if your lashing is this length and you put that rig back on jack, this line is gonna be back up to the same tension. And having got that, this is a very easy job. So we've got the material. We know it's only gonna be for months. So we're not worried about creep. We've got the jack. The only thing that can put any hitch in any of this is if the jack doesn't pump. So, so we cleaned up the, uh, the inner pack and uh, got it all connected into position. A lot easier now, I think, to see what it is that we're talking about. Here's the pack and the valve, the two jacks in position and then the metal bar that allows them to lift up the base of the mast. So I'm just going to give it a pump now and see what we're up to. We want to see if the jacks are moving. Valve closed. So 205 is our target, it's 13 tons. Okay, so that's uh, that's a hundred pound, hundred bar. Sorry, I was gonna say <laughs> it's not a hundred pound. That's a hundred bar of pressure. So I'm just gonna leave that system for a little while. Let's get our cheat sheet. I just realised I've been using those bloody Crocs I found in the uh, container, and um, 
I just had them on this morning to walk up to the uh, toilets and that, and I've walked back on the boat with them and left bloody footprints. Look at this. <laughs> oh, it's like sailing 101, yeah? Non-marking shoes. All right, so our little cheat sheet that was provided for us. 151 bar is 10 tons. So let's say that we're at seven tons now. So we check the cylinders. There's a bit of oil there. But I suspect, yeah, there's no leaks. There's no leaks on the system. It's not dropping pressure in the gauge. So we'll go on up to 150, which is 10 tons, and our target is 13.5. Uh, so. And I can feel the pump missing, missing strokes, which might be indicative of being out of oil. Right, so 150, so 150 bar there, and we know that to be 10 tons. Now the, the misses, I can feel the cylinder, rather the piston and the and the. Is it, well, I suppose piston and cylinder. Yeah, I can feel there's no oil in the jack. So, again, I'm just going to sit and watch. Sylvain was telling me a story, uh, one of the guys, I think it was the guys from uh, V1 D2, the, the riggers, he was saying he was using an old Enerpak and um, something blew unexpectedly and the gauge was uh, ended up at the, the height, they say, of the top of the mast, so it may or may not be right. true. So I'm very, very aware of big pressures in play here. I just got a little handle to play with, but that little handle is connected to reality. Okay, we're still at 150 pound and we're not losing pressure, so that's 10 tons. That's at 200 now. 200 bar, which according to our thing is about 13 tons. So we're just at liftoff pressure here. So that is pretty cool. We're at liftoff pressure. We've only got five pound to go, and I'd be able to five bar rider to go, and I'd be able to lift the mast off its um, off the brick. I'm not going to do it right now. I'm actually just going to leave this system in place here. I want to understand my tools. This uh, unit goes up to 20 tons. Um, now, have I got a unit which just does 13 and then it blows up, or have I got a unit that sits on 13 and weeps a bit of oil, or shall I store these on their side as it needs servicing? So I think if we sit with it at operating pressure for 15 or 20 minutes and just look at everything, that'd be a very wise precaution. So, Okay, so we're at 210 and See that little sliver of black there? That means that we are off jack. So that's super duper cool. Okay, well, I don't think I'm gonna do this tonight. I got four Allen bolts to undo to release the brick out of the way, the piece of metal. Um, I think I'm gonna focus my energy. It's taking a lot of time this, but it's worked out very, very well. I'm gonna let the jacks back off um, make sure you know the whole cycle is good. I'm going to put the jack back down inside the boat. Um, I've just done a little bit more work on that um, that repair on the tow rail, which should have been working long. And then uh, I think it's time for some food. Okay, we'll have to cut that off a little bit short there. Um, it went on into the evening, as you can imagine. Lots more work to be done. I've got more footage of that, but I want to keep these videos in around 25 minutes. A little bit of footage here as an outro of us crossing the Atlantic um, there, John Healy on the bow being led into Falmouth in the UK, having crossed the Atlantic as an amateur crew. Um, this is what we're all about, getting the boats out on the water. That's what's happening with the Hellcat project. We've still got a, three or four days before I leave France and I've got lots more footage to share with you. So I'll see you in the next one, the next Mariner, in a couple of days. And uh, thanks so much for all the support uh, that I've received so far with this channel. Cheers.